live. And, uh, oh, there we go. Hi guys, my name is Tony Leonard. I'm doing uh, some 2D to 3D, or rather 3D to 2D, excuse me, in the other order, uh, for our friends over at Pixelogic. And I want to thank everybody for having me in on the stream. And uh, just going to let folks fill into the room for a second and get started. This is in the process of getting set up a bit. So drop me a line in the chat and let me know if you're watching. screen black screen no more let me know if you guys can see my screen okay okay cool cool I'm gonna come back to this guy in just a second and er, go over and uh, first off, I guess, um, if you guys saw my stream last time around, uh, there were a few things that I did to achieve getting some uh, viable line art out of ZBrush. And there are basically uh, two ways to go about it, I suppose. Uh, one of the ways uh, that I did, say this for example, uh, or I also have another sample here that was done doing the same method is I use either a a shader and do a BPR and hello plans uh, do a, uh, a line art shader inside of ZBrush and of course doing the BPR and then messing with the BPR settings to get the type of line art that I want to work with uh, on a second level uh, I have the Keyshot Bridge loaded up on my ZBrush, and I can do something kind of like this, where even if I have a material on it, uh, something visible for ZBrush that I'm using, uh, I'm going to try to go over to my Render tab and do uh, External Render, and just to uh, let's see if I can do this. There we go. Sorry, I was looking for the shortcut. Shift M for a loop tool, which is really cool for magnifying in such instances. Uh, so I go to the render tab and I look under the external render and then I hit key shot, right? So now every time I hit my BPR, uh, it's going to take my model and shoot it over uh, to key shot. And then I'm going to be able to drop a material on that and adjust some of the settings for line art. So just really quickly, I'm just going to go ahead and do a test shoot. This is an older project, one that I worked out actually previous in a ZBrush demo. Uh, it was a ZBrush demo that involved uh, 2D. And going either one of two ways and using it for concept art or using the line art for something like, say, for comic book illustration. So if you're into comics, it's been done. The actual 3D model uh, for 2D is an actual thing and it does work. It's pretty awesome. So check it out. Uh, there was a series actually of um, 3D to 2D uh, demos by myself. Uh, I think by Thompson and also uh, John Mahoney and one other gentleman whose name escapes me at the moment but uh, you can probably find it on either Z Classroom or somewhere along the lines of on the Pixlogic site. So well worth looking up. It's like a any type of like 2D for, or 3D to 2D, excuse me, I keep mixing up the two, uh, for comics and or for illustration. So I'm just going to zoom in here and it's a pretty basic setup, you know, it kicked it over, it's Dynamesh, kicked it over from uh, ZBrush, it's set up. So now I really don't need a 
HDRI environment. So I'm just going to leave that as the default. However, I am going to go in the materials, do a quick search for Toon Shade. And under the Toon Shade, I'm going to drop down in a Toon Outline Black. Ah. Then I'm going to go over to Environment. Uh, and I'm probably going to go to Color for the background. And I'm going to get rid of the ground shadows, so unchecking that. And now we have a flat 2D object, right? It's 3D, of course, but when I let it go and it gets to rendering a bit, all of the nice contours, outlines, and details slowly get picked up, right? So if these were defined by, say, you know, something else besides uh, Dynamesh, I, I only use Dynamesh in this case because it's a nice, quick way to concept a mesh out uh, and sculpt on like a piece of clay and then get some details very quickly. So a lot of uh, Damien Standard brush and also using uh, the Clipping Curve brush to shape a few things. Uh, and sometimes, in some instances, positive and neg negative booleans could work for something like this. Uh, shaping up your model. Even if it was Dynamesh and you uh, maybe booleaned out a nice hard you know, uh, object with good topo from the piece, uh, you know, in the positive negative sense, it still looks nice and clean uh, when you're done. So the most cleanest result would be the, the, the best for something like this. It'll turn into line art. So now I'm just going to go ahead and under the material and key shot, uh, take this material here and edit it. So three things, basically, contour angle, width, and quality. So if I lower the contour angle, it's probably going to pick up way more detail than by default. So I can slide this back. And then I'm going to change the width just ever so slightly. And I'll make the quality up a little bit, maybe to three. OK. So now I can frame this up. All right. And again, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, or if I'm moving too fast, please do let me know over the chat, and I will be sure to go back. And uh, I'm just basically sort of doing a recap from uh, things that I did in the last stream for a few minutes. And I had a few things prepared, but I think I'm going to hold off and give them a little bit more love. And so for the next probably hour, I'm going to do not only this recap, but I'm also going to probably try to build something uh, while you're here and see how easy it is to sketch and develop something uh, for line art. All right. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and do a render really quick. And I can do presets, so something close to 1920 by 1080. Uh, I really don't have to mess with any of the render passes or anything like that, or depth pass. Uh, at this stage, I really don't think that it matters. But I'm just going to make sure that this is 300 dpi. And of course, I'm going to name it. I'm going to name it. Oh, sorry, folks, just one sec. Okay, so there we go. So I'm going to just name this sci fi pod. There we go. And I'm going to save this straight to the desktop and render it out. And it shouldn't take too long. What this is going to do is it's going to go ahead and render this. Actually, that was quite quick. So now I'm going to skip over to Photoshop. And if I was to open that sample up, uh, possibly, I'm not sure. You would probably look at the values, the XYZ. Uh, I believe it's Gainem 3D. Uh, since you're asking, you could probably read the values of the camera, maybe, and understand where the camera position is and lock it down. Uh, especially in Keyshot, if you were to go, uh, 
Now let me flip back over really quick. And Keyshot Pro, I'll close this. Uh, and I'll look at the camera. And if you were to go and set up a new camera, I'm sure from here you could probably understand maybe where the distance is. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure how you would get exact, exact, exactly the same camera shot. Um, usually I either set one up one or the other and then do a piece from one or the other and render it there. Uh, ZBrush, you can do the same thing. It doesn't exactly have uh, a tune shader that is exactly the same built in. So generally what I did was uh, I gathered a sample of different uh, uh, different materials. In fact, there's some probably on CBC. There's a couple of guys that were really smart um, and made. I forget who actually made this one, but it's called Ink Underscore Inline, and then there's Inline Two. There's a few of these shaders that are floating around out there. Uh, I think I copied some of these and toyed with them and custom tailored a material for myself. Um, and I have to actually find it. Uh, this one. I actually took a tri shader uh, and messed around with it in ZBrush, uh, tweaked some of the values, and I'll actually show you how this works. Um, this was should have been a free download, along with the demonstration that I did a while back ago. But if not, uh, I can find a way to provide it to you, or you can go looking. In fact, a, a few quick Google searches actually pulled up. Um, some ZBrush materials that were like uh, tune shader materials. But if I go, of course, to the material uh, and just load it up, here we go. I open that up. It looks a lot like this. And of course, with the render tab, uh, in fact, last time I, I did a ZBrush Live, I didn't have this material on hand. I had to go looking for it. But interestingly enough, um, when you do this, sometimes there's a little bit of cast shadows or ambient occlusion uh, somewhere in there. And, uh, usually render properties, and you can take the ambient occlusion out. Uh, and I think it's 3D posterize is the effect. Usually something like this, it didn't go over maybe 60, I think. But this 3D pulsarized number, bringing it up or bringing it down, actually made some solids. So wherever there's shadows, it actually kicked it more into a solid color. And this is cool if you're trying to get some uh, lighting effects. And you can just mess with the, also the lighting in here. And so like if I change this maybe to dead center, some of those shadows are going to change, I think. Change the angle of the camera view. And so some of them are gray, maybe. So depending on the style and look that you want, like if you wanted one that's more brush uh, as opposed to one that's more you know, of an outline, uh, you can kind of get some cool effects. I'm actually going to try to see Gainem, uh, Gainem 3D if I can um, figure out some issues between the camera position in Keyshot and, uh, and ZBrush to get them kind of dialed into the same. But I think they're two different things, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll find out because it would be actually good to know if you can. Uh... Sorry, uh, Zomax, I was just reading your comment. Yes, yes, you could. In fact, that would be about my next step. So once I have this shader on here and I've messed with like the render tab and not the external renderer, sorry, but uh, rather the render properties. Uh, between the level of this 3D posterize, if I bring it up or down, it's probably going to give me more shadow or less shadow. So let's say if I bump it back up and play with it. So right about there, and I have a minimal amount of shadow, right? What I can then do is I need to probably switch over my background. Uh, go to document, and we'll change the color back to white. There we go. All right? And of course, probably with this I have to do the same thing. I have to probably take a, and turn the external renderer off. So I'm just going to go render, external render, uncheck key shot, and then I'll do a VPR of this.
Yeah, it's fairly quick, very, pretty good. So, difficult thing about this is I really didn't set a document size, so probably the resolution might come about out a little bit low, but I know what I can do. Uh, I'll go ahead and just go not here. BPR render passes and take the shaded view, click it, and just save it out. So, sci fi pod BPR 0001. BPR, just for example's sake. And I'll go ahead and save that. And I'll skip over to Photoshop again. And I'll open two things. Uh, one would have been. Oop, there we go. And let's see here. Got too much stuff. Let's details. Date. There we go. So I'll open the one. Okay, so let's start with this one first. Okay, so it's got a, back bl a black background, and I actually need to fill that. Uh, I could come back over to ZBrush really quick, and just for example's sake, take and save out that mask. Uh, yep, that'll work. I'll come back over here and open it as well. Our mask. All right, so I'll just copy this mask. I'm doing a select all and just copying it. All right. And this, I will actually go back over to the other image, and in its channels, I'll make a new channel and just paste, right? And that way, I can click and drag the whole thing as a selection, going back to the RGB channel, right? And then I can invert it, have a nice white here, and I can default to black and white, which is something that I want to do. Uh, and then I can fill it. There we go. So now that we have this, I need to check also the, our DPI, uh, DPI settings. Yeah, no, hey! What's up, Dan? Nice to see you. So let's see here. Right? So 72 DPI, we need to go up to 300 to do a few tricks. So to get things kind of like over here, now this one is a finished piece that I kind of messed around and did some nice gradual fills uh, and there's also some things that I invented to do halftone screens so I made a huge uh, sort of template, master template of halftone screens and all of these are basically camera ready uh, dots uh, if you watch my last stream I talked about how you get line art prepared for print a bit so like if you're doing comic books or anything like that uh, this piece actually I added a few effects to some of the line art uh, like an outline and so forth but the actual halftone uh, screens on here and also the line art itself came from a source that was actually uh, I run tolerance on it so it actually kicks out every gray pixel and leaves only black and white all right so part of that is due to an action set that I made uh, and then I set up things a lot of times for doing black and white line art and therefore, you know, I use halftone screens. And then I scrape off the halftone screens for uh, contrasted effects, right? And with this, I added a little bit of color. Maybe I, I think I did a chromatic aberration, and so there's sort of like a nice little sort of almost retro-like haze in between things because it's kind of shifting the RGB of the, uh, the artwork layer, right? And I think I did a fill where I outlined it, and that's how you get this nice thick outline on the outside because it was looking a bit thin when I rendered it in Keyshot. So if I go back, I'm going to go back to this sample here. So here we have something that is gray uh, and we're probably in RGB mode which means that probably to work with it as inked line art I'm going to go to grayscale. So I'll go ahead and do that and I'll probably just do a bit of an image size or create a new document. So let's just do that. Create a new document. There we go. Uh, and I think I'll do inches. I'm going to do eight and a half by eleven at three hundred DPI. I'll create. 
and that mode was grayscale. So I'll go over here, copy it all, bring it to here, and it's probably going to be a little bit smaller. So I'm going to scale it up. That was Command T. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's rotate it and do it this way. Get a little bit more use of the paper that way. Oops. There we go. And I'll hit Enter and commit it. All right? And I'll use the Vignette tool because it's on its own layer. And I'll just go and rotate the image clockwise. There we go. So now we have a 300 DPI line art sample. It came from a model that, which was made in ZBrush, right? So now, of course, now that it's grayscale mode, I'm going to go ahead and just flatten the image because right now it's that pasted image plus the background. I'll hit Control E, right? So it's a solid grayscale image. And then I'll come over to my action set and there's an action set here that I made, and I'm still, like, again, I'm going to make sure that I can get it to you guys uh, if you want to get your hands on it. But basically, I use it for cleaning up comic book illustration work. So post-scanning here is going to run levels, curves, and threshold. Uh, and it's so quick that you might not notice it, but if you play it, you'll see what it happens. Right? So everything in this image now shifted to black and white, even if you zoom in really really close all of the line art is stepped in sort of a bitmap fashion and so there's no no anti-aliasing right so we're good so now that we've created this I could literally separate the line art which now here in the line art or where it says line work masking separation if I click this action then with this default setting to the foreground and background color so it's going to fill a layer with black only for the channel using quick mask right and it's nice it's a nice clean source so it should separate really nicely right and later of course let's say for printing reasons if you were in the comic book business you know not exceeding 300% uh, uh, black is very important for prepress so for something like this even if you were working in RGB and then switched to CYMK, which sometimes, uh, you know, if you're working digital for digital printing, four color processing is always not not always that that important. But on you know just to, to keep a standard, um, you know, you'll have a mask of the line art saved, uh, and then you should have you know your coloring layers or whatnot as you set them up. So if I just run this really quick, I'm going to go ahead and push play. Boom! It's probably already done really quick little action but I'll show you basically what this means so here I have my line art layer right it took using quick mask and made a selection out of the line art using the grayscale image inverted it filled it on a new transparent layer with black and so now you just have a nice white background and you could simply if you were going for color you could simply name this color work in between, switch over your image from mode, grayscale, over to RGB, don't flatten, and there you go. You have a file that's ready for coloring. So let's say, for example, pull up a hard brush, adjust it. All right. And in my Photoshop, uh, as far as the palettes go, I use Copic uh, markers a lot in my actual you know, analog drawings, and so I carry that over by using uh, Copics in Photoshop. Now, I think it's free, but you can load up uh, Copic colors into your Photoshop. So I'm just going to pick a nice little cool gray. If I start painting, very quickly just kind of block out colors in one spot. Alright. Yeah, Dan, this is exactly what I was talking about in class. Uh, actually, 100%. There we go. Maybe something a little darker. So 
So I can do flats and fills, something like this. And what's nice is if you were doing something for comic book illustration or concept art where you needed to show a turnaround, you could have line art uh, that you can treat uh, from just a simple Dynamesh sketch and then bring that into Photoshop, color it up, um, and then maybe do a turnaround you know, with several different views. You could change your camera angle uh, and you could color it up. And then later, if you didn't want the line art per se, but you wanted to do a total paint over, you could go on the top of this and start you know, painting, doing a paint over. So if I say paint over layer, there we go. Uh, if you were doing a paint over layer, you could you know, totally just paint right over the top. Um, I'm kind of being a little bit lazy here, but I could probably just turn on uh, shape dynamics and thicken it up a bit, you know, do transfer, and you could start you know, doing some more rendered sort of squishy brush type of uh, rendering, uh, placing values in the top and over and also on the bottom. So something like that. Right? So the color layer is going to look like just blobs of fill and the line art keeps it nice and tight when it's turned on. And although this is probably 100% black in this film. So if I do a color picker and, uh, and sample it, uh, I'm sure probably, yeah, it's going to be on this corner, which is probably closer. I mean, I think it has its uh, different values, but if let's say you wanted to set it up for print, probably over to this side, and I would just go and CYMK it. So I think it's like uh, 40, 40, let's see, uh, 60, 100. So that's something like 260 coverage, right? I could select that, I could go to the line art, select all, and cut it. And although I just deleted all of the line art, I still have a channel retained of the line art. So what I could do is I could pull that down to a selection and just fill it again, right? And now you have a layer where the black is going to be true black not like special black or anything like that. I think uh, there's a few crazy different uh, uh, blacks for pre-press. Uh, sometimes they come out a little bit richer or not in some cases, but 260% uh, coverage, as long as you don't exceed 300, I think you're good. But I think it's like 40, 40, 60, 100 is a good number uh, to fill it with. But if you ever needed to refill it, you know, you always have your channel saved and left over and this is because of that action set I set it up so that if you should make a mistake uh, yeah I do I might Dynam actually have a few different um, tricks for print it depends on if you're going black and white or color I suppose but uh, generally and let's say for example I'm gonna duplicate this uh, let's say in the event that you wanted to do color so I'm gonna duplicate the image uh, I won't do merge layers I'll just make a sci-fi pod black and white right. so I'll go here duplicate it and I'll get rid of this color layer oops get rid of that oh derp get rid of that that okay so let's just say for example if I was gonna go uh, black and white so most of the filter the or the action set that I ran just a second ago it made all of this line art bitmap ready right so if I was to save this as a tip or something it's gonna print beautiful on paper because you're not even gonna see the steps no human eye would be able to literally sorry Photoshop's being a little weird literally go in there and see the actual steps. It would actually smooth out on paper. Uh, you could make K Zomex uh, an actual black, um, and I'm sure it would probably come out. But like I said, usually in the rule in comics is 
uh, no more than 300% coverage, I think you'll have some problems, uh, especially for something like offset printing. It may not may be the case for something as far as like digital printing, uh, but you know, as far as like publications or books, but usually the CYMK fills, they try to keep uh, lower than 300% coverage. I know it sounds weird. I, I've, I've actually asked the question about uh, just a solid 100% uh, black K channel for everything, and they, it was like a no-go. So I guess it needs to use some of the other colors in the spectrum to make an actual true black. Yeah, I know it's crazy, right? Mathematically speaking, you would think it would just be, be just black as K, and that would be 100%. But I think there's two different. There, there's like a difference between special black, rich black, and just regular 100% black. <laughs> so, okay, so let's say if I wanted to go black and white with this one. So what I would do is I would go ahead and set this back up in mode grayscale, and I'm not going to flatten it, so don't flatten. And then I have something on hand that I just spoke of. Uh, let's see, I'm going to do, uh, where, where did it go? There we go. Gonna open up these two. These are templates that I made of halftone screens. So if you ever, I'm a big fan of Japanese manga, you know, and I think that's probably the biggest influence in my work. Um, and so I set upon myself to make some halftone screens, right? So I made some halftone screens, and they're all collected. And generally, I sell these on on Gumroad, but uh, you know, maybe I could work out giving a sample of these out to folks. But all of these are 300 DPI use uh, halftone screens. And they go from, say, 27.5 on up to a, maybe 50 line per inch at 300 DPI. Right? They are a very specific line screen. Uh, and when I want some contrasting effects uh, on the page, you know, like, say, if somebody has a red shirt, how do you communicate that in, in black and white? Right? So let's just say, for example, uh, for example's sake, that I take uh, maybe a 20% at 32.5 lines per inch, right? And I zoom out. I'm actually going to keep this guy over here. And I'm going to take the other customs and put it over here. I have some special, I have two files. One has like a, some custom gradations that I made uh, at about 30 and 40 line per inch. But let's just say for now, I want this screen over here. So I could just simply go to the layer in the template, click and drag it over, and it'll copy it over. All right? So I'll full screen that. Very easily, I can place it so I've got good coverage. Uh, I can actually take this and just rotate it. I'm going to do, there, turn it sideways. Usually I don't want to rotate these too much, but every once in a while if it's a simple dot, a dot pattern, uh, you can rotate it, but don't resize it, uh, being a rule, because if you resize it, then it changes the line per inch calculation, and in some cases, if you printed it, you might get a moire or plug up a press, uh, because it'll be, it's like using, uh, it's like using tiny little dots for the plate which prints onto tiny little dots that are already in the artwork, and then when that line screen number gets screwy, it can stop a press, like it could apply too much ink coverage and make it totally black and your print would go blah, right? So I'm just going to move this into position, so just be careful not to resize it, that's a major point. I'm going to do this, right? And I'm going to keep the title of this line screen, just for reference, but I'm going to add a layer mask, so I could just click down here hit the layer mask, and I'm going to fill this mask actually with black. So if I do that, all right? So now it looks like I deleted somehow all of the dots, but not really. They're actually, the pattern is there on the layer, and the mask is just black. So now I can just get the, my brush out. I'm just going to choose a hard round uh, at 100% opacity. I'm actually going to go into the brush settings. Uh, tighten this up just a bit. I'm going to turn transfer off and just keep it as a solid hard brush. And now I can come in here uh, using white, excuse me. So I'll make white the foreground color. 
that's X on the keyboard. And while you have the mask selected, go ahead and paint. And I'm applying this one half tone to the drawing. So I'm not being too careful as to, you know, painting within the lines, but I can fix that later. So I will. So as you can see, for something like this for comics is really badass because uh, you can put down some tones and then you can erase them later, and it's totally non-destructive. So it's not applied to the actual artwork. Uh, working digitally, you have a lot of options. So I could actually put on tone. I could layer that tone. I could actually do smaller gradations and whatnot. Uh, and then what I would do later is just save it as a TIFF. So I'm going to show you how to do that once I finish this up. So I'm just going to put some more screen tone on here. Yeah, you totally could. You could use ZBrushes like, um, as sort of like, a, you know, your your, your sculpting bed <laughs> to draw stuff. Um, me, I, I'm a big proponent of just drawing all, most of what I need to do in comics. But sometimes when I want to establish, like, say, a, a, a shot of like an environment, I could build a mock-up or something, or maybe a vehicle. Uh, or you know, I'm I'm also known for doing a lot of hard surface design, and so you know when I when I do like a, some kind of crazy mech, like I don't want to draw that in a comic frame over and over and over and over again. Um, maybe with some alteration. I mean, sure. I mean, the ch part of the artistic challenge is yes, gr drawing something and being able to understand it uh, three dimensionally. But that said, you know, if you had a lot of uh, production to do, uh, you could do something like building a, a model and working it out in ZBrush in its environment uh, as a sculpt and then you could take that and turn it into 2D line art and it would be very easy to compose you know different shots and different camera angles um, from ZBrush and or from key, uh, ZBrush to Keyshot um, and then work those out. So something like this is really cool because um, there's two different flavors I guess you would say. Um, one is if you use ZBrush and the sort of tune shade that I made and played around with, of course messing with those 3D posterization and you know, also your light position, you can figure out some sort of thick contrasted areas, right? Like say here at the top and along the bottom, and it has a pretty good size on the outline where you have some accentuated line quality going on. That is pretty sweet, right? Like these little blocked areas here, it almost looks like um, like the model was run through like uh, Xerox kind of filters or something like that, and it just inked it out for me. And it would take very little to just you know go in with a brush before I do uh, the post scanning action that I have set up here, and just add some and some uh, line art or redact some areas, clean it up. Uh, maybe you might want a little less detail and you want to redact some of the information. Um, you know you could do that, or you could make it very much straight uh, and kick it over to Keyshot and you could get more of a sort of I guess maybe more stenciled type of line art quality and then work from that and redo it. Uh, a lot of times and I have to, still have to experiment with this in a way that I can broadcast it is I want to actually show you guys later in, in some later streams I want to print something out like this ink it by hand and then rescan it and bring it back into Photoshop so in other words, using ZBrush to build a model, put it in a panel, turn it into something like uh, pencils for comics, and then print that to a board, ink it by hand, scan it, and bring it back to Photoshop. So yes, yes, to answer your question, Gynum 3D, I actually, uh, I actually illustrate much by hand, uh, analog, but I also do work digitally, and I also sculpt in ZBrush. So. Uh, for those who are kind of wondering, is it very hard to go from uh, a 3D application for 2D means? No, it's not. It's actually quite easy uh, to integrate the two, right? Especially if you have something where, you know, in a 3D grid, uh, you ha might have something like, say, a, a populated scene 
where you have like a lot of different characters interacting with each other or, and then you want to mix that or pair it with like say an environment uh, it should be very easy to, to work with those so. so this is just a simple sort of like drone that I sketched out some time ago it's actually been about a year I think I came across the project and I thought I would share it because it was a pretty good sample for li doing line art right and again from that I could go either two, one of two ways and that's doing a BPR inside of ZBrush or inside of Keyshot. So I'm actually going to go back to Photoshop really quick and we'll just do that just one more time. We'll go back to my tone here and I'll pick something different, say 40%. I'll drag it over. I'll put a layer mask on it. Make the layer mask black. Flip the colors back again to white and I'll start brushing in something else. Maybe some darker stuff here. And of course, you know, just using B for brush and E for uh, the eraser tool. It's pretty handy. So I, I keep my, I mean, if you could see my camera, I have to figure out my OBS, but I think um, there's something where I should be able to have a live webcam and be able to stream using a disk desktop capture that I've got to work out for you guys. But as soon as I get it figured out, you can see probably uh, I usually keep my left hand on the keyboard. <laughs> so, so much like manga, I can go through with an eraser tool and just kind of build some little specular points and a screen tone. And lastly, in this process, what I'll usually like to do is save these as a bitmap uh, and then save it as a TIFF. So once you back out, you can see where there's tone, you can see where you know the two different patterns have different uh, degrees of uh, shade. So I think this is a 40% size dot versus this being a 20% size dot. And when you print it out, it just looks awesome. It looks print. It like just just looks like regular like Japanese manga, classic screen tone. Alright. You can use these on color work. It works just fine. Uh, you just have to do the screen tone, then create a copy that's flattened, and then separate that in the same way using this line work masking separation. Which is basically just, if I was to give you a rundown of this, it's all of this. It's uh, making a selection from the grayscale image, inverting it, and then using a few quick mask steps to go ahead and make a new layer and fill it in black. It works with any uh, grayscale image. So like, you know, any resolution at grayscale, it'll take and clean it up, and then it'll separate the, li the line art. So anything along the channel of being black, uh, it will take and make it a, a quick mask. Mask it out. Uh, there are a few matte caps, Art Dur or I believe your name is Art Durs. Uh, you can probably find them. I know some time ago I did a Google search uh, and there was a gentleman, I believe his name is Pablo, uh, who did a really great uh, tutorial. Uh, I think, believe it was, in, it was in PDF form. And uh, I guess, yeah, I, I guess I just made it up. I just, uh, Blanz, I, I just basically used kind of the same knowledge that I would do for 2D analog work uh, and brought it over to ZBrush, uh, the same approach. Um, I suppose it's kind of a weird thing, but I'm sure like if you if you could probably consider and know both tools, uh, I just basically use those tools to do what I normally would have done by hand and then digital. Because I, I do a lot of hand drawing that I then digitize and then keep messing with until I have final line art. So uh, something like uh, let's see, sorry, go back one more. There we go, turn the land in the right spot. Uh, I believe this one here, 
is an image that I did uh, some time ago now. But in the same way, all of this is in ZBrush, right? And the line art was separated in exactly the same way. In fact, I think um, once I had the line art and the fills done, the fills I had to go through in a race uh, because my masks that were set up uh, had forgotten a few uh, spots that were clipped out uh, or that should have been clipped out. And so I just had to tailor the mask just a, a tiny bit. But all of the actual line art, and if you look at it, it's actually literally about the same thing, except I don't think I uh, ran tolerance on this line art, per se, or either it's been aliased from resizing it and then coloring it. But uh, I did some special things on this one. Oh, sorry about that. Almost jammed up Photoshop for some reason. I got a lot of files open. There we go. But all of the hard surface uh, stuff in here was done in ZBrush and then rendered out, uh, I believe at the time I was using Keyshot to do this. Uh, so you can see it's, it has more of a sort of stencil quality about it. It's very straightforward. Um, and like I was saying, between using a, an actual matte cap that I've made inside of ZBrush, yeah, it looks very much different. Uh, it looks a little bit more technical, I would say. And then I just use something simple, like a simple scheme to do some flats. Uh, and I think this sort of hazy sepia look behind the line art, which I wanted to try to achieve, I actually copied the line art, blurred it massively using Gaussian blur, and then I think did a fill of like a brown color, a reddish brown color, uh, over the black line art. And that's how I achieved this look. So, let's go back here. So this was the BPR copy, right? This was the mask that I used. This is the one that I'm messing with now with color. And this is the black and white. Right? So let's just say, for example, say, let me go ahead and fill a little bit more of this out. there. I'm still on the same mask for 40%. Let me do 20. I'll click here on the mask and draw again with the brush. I always like screen tone because it kind of gives like a different sense of contrast and depth for comic art. Yeah, it totally does, doesn't it? It looks like, for it, between the two different mat, or like the matte cap and the actual like uh, tune shade that happens inside of uh, Keyshot, you can get kind of some interesting results. In fact, maybe even mixing them. Like if you had an object at one camera angle and then you mixed it with line art from another thing and edited it, I'm sure you could probably get some really interesting results. Like, uh, let's say if you had. Uh, I'll just create a little note layer. There we go. Let's say you had an object in the foreground, and then you had, you know, like a background that was rendered inside of uh, Keyshot's Tune Shader, or with Keyshot's Tune Shader. One might be thin line art, while this one could be heavy line art, right? And you could mix and match them, probably, and just do a little bit of erasing. That would that would totally work. So I'm gonna actually, no, I keep that around. Go here. 20%, still got the same brush, so I keep filling.
And let's also maybe grab one more. Uh, I'm going to grab something super light, like 10%. There we go. Interestingly enough, and I know I kind of separated from ZBrush just every little bit uh, into Photoshop, but with the eraser tool, if you have like a, a hard eraser, a hard round, uh, and that is at 100%, you can actually scratch some of this off. Uh, a lot of times, I use cross hatching methods for this. So, like if I if I fill in something, and I use an eraser, and I go against angle. a bit. If I can rotate this and then I'll erase just changing the angle. So if the lines that I've made now erasing some of the dots are going in this perpendicular angle, I'm going to change it just by like a degree or so like I would when I'm drawing cross etching and you can get some sort of nice like little stepped erasure of the dots. Almost like if you were using a real screen tone, uh, which, you know, there are some Japanese manga brands of screen tone, but screen tone, uh, like Zipatone that used to be made long ago, it's kind of hard to get your hands on these days. So this is a great way to do it. Uh, and I'll rotate it, but I could do some effects like that like erasing and sort of a, a crosshatch method. Oops. There we go. So I'll just keep turning the angle a little bit until I get like a nice little erasure. All right, and when you zoom out, it looks a little smoother. Yeah, matte cap brushes would be awesome. Um, I suppose you could use a matte cap with a brush, uh, and certain objects could be filled with a line art. I'm not sure how it would look uh, by comparison to a few other materials, but generally what I do when I'm trying to uh, work or do a render, BPR render or Keyshot render uh, from ZBrushes, I'll sculpt uh, in a different uh, matte cap, uh, like say something like a uh, there's a few good ones out there, or something like um, either some Nomon or regular, you know, just even basic material, really. You know? Uh, and then. Uh, that's that, but. It actually got darker. Probably because I messed with uh, changing the color of a few things, uh, like the 3D posterization and stuff like that, but. Render, render properties. So we'll turn this down to zero. Make sure that's that way. And document has to be back to something else. And I think my light is a little bit funky. That's probably what it is. But something like that. Yeah, I would, I would just probably change the material to something that's visible. This is not very visible. Uh, black color. Nope. I'm not sure, but I did something to my materials. Sorry about that. Yep, there we go. So I would sculpt this way, and then finally I would put... Uh, a line work or a line art shader on it, like a tune shade, or kick it, you know, to key shot and work it out there. But uh, this is pretty much what the sculpt looks like by itself as an object. All right. So back here. Sorry about that. I have the 
peanut gallery around for a Saturday afternoon. Every once in a while they make their way So something like this. And so finally, let's say now that I go ahead and take this and duplicate it just one last time, and I'll say this this is this will be the flat. Okay. So once flat, I'll duplicate it merged. I still have the line art channel probably along with this, although now I probably don't need it, so I'm just gonna go ahead and trash it. Uh, I could in turn come back to the action set and with the same action that I used to separate it, hit it again, making sure that the mode is grayscale. And it'll separate it all, right? And so now I have everything with the halftone on one single line art layer, right? And it's saved to a channel. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just leave this flat, actually. So I'll flatten it, and then I'm going to go ahead and switch this over to bitmap. So where the MOBE is just above grayscale, you'll find that the first item is bitmap. Uh, yes, you could try to get a blurry line uh, look. What I do is I just save the channel, uh, and I'll have one set layer that has line art on it that I'll do like a Gaussian blur. And then, or maybe you could even do like a sort of drop shadowed effect or uh, use the effects, the layer effects, by double clicking the one of the line art layers, blurring that or adding an effect to it, and then keeping the other on top of it or underneath it. Uh, sometimes uh, stuff like that it will work. In fact, uh, as I was just mentioning previous, let me unstick my Photoshop here for a second. I think I hit some weird funky key command that changes my... Oh no, sorry, it was off on the other screen. Uh, let me just go ahead and apply this really quick. This is bitmap. Uh, I'll set it to 300 dpi for the output, and then I'll use 50% threshold. And what that does is, again, it keeps that image down to a bitmap image, so there's no aliasing, no gray pixels anywhere. It's just straight up black and white, right? And this I would save as a TIFF, and this would be my most print ready, right? So TIFF. Uh, yep. Sci-fi pod, right? You could use a proof setup, but really it doesn't matter at this point because the image would just be saved as a TIFF. Uh, and 100% black it takes out all the color information anyway so if you're using uh, this for black and white it would come out exactly like this everything stays sharp crisp and then probably the lines smooth out a slight bit on the printing press uh, if you were gonna blur for black and white what I would really do is probably maybe when you before you bitmap it uh, I think you could actually dither stuff and or you could probably apply like a half tone to it um, so that way it ends up being oh thank you um, it ends up being more of a just like a flat image right so like even if you had shadowed stuff or gradients in it that you know were natural from some type of shading uh, those would end up being uh, turned into a half tone perhaps right any lasting questions Thanks, FH Concepts. Appreciate it. So yeah, that's basically kind of how I ended up uh, doing this image. Uh, this model is something that I am working on in ZBrush, and I actually have grander plans to maybe take this into Marmoset and doing some uh, some rendering there. But I also want to generate like an outfit or some clothing items. Uh, which means that I need to go study uh, Marvelous or something like that. 
rather than sculpting the clothing, which I could be in quite intricate, but uh, using ZBrush together with Marmoset would be probably a way to go to create some uh, cloth items, you know, as a cloth simulator. Uh, but all of the hard surface stuff in here was either done in ZBrush or I think maybe the forearms, which are kind of like a weird blocky shape, uh, were just a test Boolean shape, so there's a little bit of redesigning, but I, I went ahead and finished off uh, a final image from, from last. Uh, this is it. So when you take a, a look at this, all of these other layers ended up being a part of this. Or if I turn them off uh, slowly, this is what it kind of looked like at its inception. So everything's down here. I think uh, just clicking through it can kind of show you what was involved. So I'll turn these guys off and turn the line art back on. So this is where I started, right? And this is the render that I got out of Keyshot. Uh, reflection and reflection, uh, it's possible to do it. Uh, the way that I would go about it, uh, DC Turner, to answer your question, is if I had an image, say, uh, line art on one side, and then I skipped over and copied the reverse of that, uh, I'd probably do something like that, and then see about rendering both of those in line using a matte cap and or a tune shader, uh, and then I would probably use the channel left from the reverse side and fill that channel with a gradient, much like I did here with uh, a lot of layer masking for the uh, screen tones. Hmm, I suppose either, either one would be comparable with each other. I think um, the interesting thing about probably the camera that's pretty easy to do, and I'm sure you could probably do the same with, key shot, or, uh, with Photoshop, or excuse me, with ZBrush, uh, is setting up a camera in one position and then being able to save that camera. So like if I go over to Keyshot, and let's say right now I'm using my, my, my first camera, the first unsaved camera, I could save this camera if I wanted to, uh, and I could also make a, a new one. So in the new one I might, you know, turn it around, make it a little bit bigger, closer, and it would change between the two, right? Or at least it was supposed to. I didn't save the camera, so it's probably not locked into its orientation. Or I could lock it, name it, and I could flip between the two. Right. Every once in a while it repositions itself, uh, but you could make a different camera view and just save it. I think if you move, move it in one, it might by default affect the other. But yeah, it's pretty easy to set up a, a, a camera angle. Like if I, if I wanted to do something like this, like it's, it's flying overhead, uh, I could re-render this. And that's sort of the tangibility, that speaks to sort of the tangibility of doing line art in this way, um, which is really cool. Uh, is that if I wanted to change the the uh, perspective view, you know, like by default, I think it's going to put it somewhere in the 30s. I like to render stuff that's uh, uh, a little higher than that, maybe like 88, and it'll be maybe a little bit truer. So I think if this is number, this perspective number is lower, like say 33 or 32, it's probably going to add more of a skew. So. I guess the perspective would increase, and if you make it higher, so like if I did 88, it's probably going to be closer, like uh, in the same way in ZBrush. Okay, let me put this tone shader back on here. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Right? And my light, I'm just going to bring the intensity of this light down a little bit. Turn it. There we go. Make sure I'm using all white. There we go. And so some things, again, are shadowed, but sometimes, this is an interesting thing, but if you, in ZBrush, at certain angles with this tune shape, you get little tiny strokes. Now this looks to be the faceting of the geometry, and it's actually making strokes out of the faceting. So it looks kind of like 
I went in and hand drew some some uh, some cross hatching in some spots, but it's actually the texture of the the surface of the topology, which you know is dynamesh for the most part. And some of these uh, little objects might have come from uh, sets where I just kit bashed an object in really quick, but everything else I either you know sculpted or st stamped in, right? And so even as it shades things, it reads the light and puts an outline around the actual, probably the edge, and so it looks like that gray area there when zoomed in is actually cross-hatched or something. It's kind of kind of interesting. So, How much of it is actually retained? Maybe in grayscale it might retain itself, but once you run, like if you ran my filter and ran a tolerance, depending on the size and the resolution, some of those may or may not show. Uh, you could isolate material ideas um, or polygroups into separate renders. Uh, yes. Uh, one is if you had different materials on different pieces of things, like this is all one manifold mesh, and I think uh, probably the little pods down here, uh, those might be some separate geo. If it actually looks like this, right, which is nothing pretty. Uh, Subtool wise, I think I have just a short order of objects, but yes, you could probably apply, uh, if you take the RGB off on a standard brush and just hit the material channel, uh, it could apply different materials to each object, and then I believe if you're going to work in Keyshot, you can hit the render tab, and on your external render, you could split groups by materials. Uh, and then once, of course, you know, when you move over to Keyshot, uh, let's say if I wasn't going to do this, if I wanted a different look, um, like let's say if I wanted, uh, I don't know, different material. Tune outline, right? Outlines in green, red, you know, you could do different things with that. Um, but you could just drag and drop on each material. If I hold Alt, of course, and drag and drop it on here, it keeps the, like if you were working with something with material IDs that were physically painted on, uh, if they were different subtools, you could drop a material onto individual parts holding Alt, and it wouldn't change the vertex color or the poly paint. It would just make the it would just make a material change, right? Which I'm sure is affected by render and lighting. Uh, for masking areas with uh, different materials, um, yeah, you probably could. Uh, if you made a different material for each, you know, of course. Inside of here, um, when you do a render, you notice something maybe, uh, let's see, Command P or Control P. Here's the render. There's a render pass here, uh, and you could render all layers. So in other words, each material that you set up here, you could probably make uh, a separate uh, render of just the material alone. And they're called the render layers, I believe. All right, so like if I, if I edit this material, I think somewhere at the bottom here, uh, there was, should have been a way to actually label uh, each render property or each material property. Uh, it's been a minute since I've done it, but you could basically do uh, a render of each pass for each material when you render, and then basically you could take those and batch process them in Photoshop and put all of those materials, you know, for one render uh, under separate layers. Yes, a clown pass also will do something like that. Uh, like if you check here where it says passes on clown pass and also a depth pass, it will uh, generate a depth pass, a geometric normal pass uh, that you can use. What it doesn't do is, I don't think, it is probably kick out something like, uh, you know, how BPR, you can actually select, you know, ambient occlusion or something like that. Um, I'm not, for something like this workflow, I'm not sure how much you would want to use something like ambient occlusion, but, uh, yeah, you could work with material IDs for stuff, or just basically set up materials inside of ZBrush, and then those should keep when you actually kick it over to Keyshot. It'll just be a different material on a different subtool, right? Because if you don't name it, uh, if you don't name your subtools, like if they have, if they're copies of things and they have like the same name, uh, even if you kick it over to Keyshot, it will probably see it as the same manifold mesh. 
there'll be two different objects, but it'll it won't separate it. Uh, no, I think I don't think that you have to do mess with the EXR file a whole lot. I I don't particularly mess with them all that much. Um, sometimes when I'm rendering something out, uh, where I tend to use some of those passes, like let's say if I go back to this illustration here. I think in here I have something like an actual pass. And this is a clown pass, right? So in other words, it took one object, which is the manifold mesh of this sculpt, and then it took two shoulder objects, and it, it, it made some material definition between that one and this one, right? But this only works for like a pretty much like a, a static image. If you're looking for material IDs to apply, what I would just do is on your actual geometry, like you could either take it by the poly group, uh, let's say for example, uh, I'm going to go, change this to gray, right, and then I'm going to add a different, uh, there we go, different material. So I might work an environment like this, right, and then each different uh, tool will probably have a different poly group. That poly group I can actually use as a material ID. I can also hold down uh, the transpose tool, like hit W, Y to toggle it, and if I control click on the poly group, it'll mask everything else but the poly group, of course, right? Then you could use a color fill as a, a material ID and just bam, fill it, right? Yes, EXR files usually for the passes, and then you could use those. I What I usually do is copy uh, the passes, uh, like geometric normal and whatnot. I'll copy them and put them into the channels. It comes through sort of in a black and white manner, but if I want to use one of those channels for like the levels uh, or changing the exposure to something, uh, I have done something like that. For a line art, it's just a little bit more simple. I, I sculpt it turn it into line art, and then work with it as a static image. Uh, material IDs usually are something that I would do if I was going to actually texture something. Yeah, no worries, no worries, no worries. So, let's see. How much time? We're actually over time. Okay, so next time around, what I'm going to try to do is actually uh, take more time to build some props, uh, maybe in the next week or so, uh, that we can use as line art. And uh, still, there's something that I want to do next time around as far as having uh, comic book assets or sculpt individual sculpts and use them in an actual comic book panel. Uh, I think I've done that once before with this one, but I want to do something a little bit more updated. And what I'll do is I'll try to make an actual layout. So in other words, you get to see each piece as treated as a comic book frame, uh, and then I also wanted to do some stuff to produce some like mechanical designs, somewhat like this, and actually ink them in by hand and then redigitize them. Okay. So, uh, assume, I suppose if there's a way through the channel, uh, you know, if you have any afterthoughts or questions or you know inquiries or anything that you didn't understand, please uh, do shoot me a message. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook. Uh, I go by Tony Leonard and or Tony Coros Studios uh, and yeah sure look me up ask me questions um, I'll be sure to try to get back to you guys if you have any awesome well thank you have a good weekend everyone and I'll be closing out the stream cheers guys uh, Twitter yes you can also follow me on Twitter uh, I believe I'm at, at Tony Coro that's T-O-N-I-K-O-R-O so here, I'll just uh, type it out. Bam. That would be me on Twitter. All right, guys. Uh, and I also, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, I post a lot of stuff on Instagram a lot. You can find me at, on Instagram as the same moniker, T-O-N-I-K-O-R-O. -O. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. And have a good weekend. Peace.